this next section is called uh, definition of the derivative. Uh, this is one of the most important uh, things that we do in calculus, uh, deal with the derivative. And I'm going to take a little different uh, turn than the, in, than, uh, in presentation than what the book does. I'm first going to discuss how to find the derivative of a function. And after we uh, experiment and practice finding the derivative, then I'm going to go back and discuss the significance of the derivative. So first we're just going to do some plain old calculations, but we need to know how to do that. So uh, we start with the derivative, or the definition. Let's say that the derivative of a function f of x is denoted with this notation. It's denoted by okay, f prime of x. So not a 1, not an exponent. We, we pronounce that as prime, f prime of x. And once again, the way we say that is f prime of x. Now, the definition of this f prime of x, the definition of the derivative, whoops, of the derivative, I'm having a difficult time writing, as you can see, of the derivative, that is, how we find it. or the way we calculate it is with this limit. That is, the derivative f prime of x is equal to the limit of, okay, that's a fraction. The numerator of the, numerator of the fraction is f of x plus h minus f of x. All of that's divided by h. And the limit is as h approaches zero. And so you can see immediately that that's something that we can't calculate quickly in most cases because that would make the denominator zero. Well, we'll start out with an example. I think I'll start a fresh page with the example uh, because it's rather lengthy. So we'll, uh, we'll look at that next. Okay, our first problem, let's we'll call it problem one. Uh, is to find the derivative of f of x is equal to x squared minus 3. Okay, now just to get started, Let's write down the definition of the derivative again. Remember, f prime of x is equal to the limit of the fraction f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h as h approaches 0. Uh, the, the process of finding this derivative or finding this limit, there's really four steps. And the first step is before we can find the limit, we've got to know what that fraction looks like. And before we can find out what that fraction looks like, we've got to understand the single component f of x plus h. We need to know what that component looks like. So remember, the rule for f of x says when we have an input x, whatever the input is, this is the way we deal with that input. We square it, and then we subtract 3. Well, in the case of f of x plus h, the input into the function is x plus h. So that's actually what we square, and then we subtract 3. We square the input, 
subtract 3. Now, squaring x plus h, we need to think a bit about. Uh, so, in the future, I may not go to this detail, but let's understand when we square x plus h, that means we're multiplying x plus h with itself. And so that's just a matter of using FOIL, isn't it? We'll say x times x. And of course, that gives us an x squared. And then we say x times h. Now, uh, when we multiply two letters together, like x times y, we simply call that xy. So we can call this xh. But we have a tradition that I'll explain in a moment. When we multiply two letters together, we like to list them in alphabetical order. So rather than saying xh, we're going to say hx. And then we have h times x, and of course, that's hx also. And then we have h times h, and of course, that's h squared. Now, this is the point that I was making a moment ago. If we would have first called, instead of hx, when we did uh, x times h, if we would have called that xh, we might not recognize that these two are the same. But when we write everything in alphabetical order, we're noticing that we have an hx and another hx, and so we recognize that we can combine those. And so it's just a simple matter of convenience so that we'll recognize things that are alike. So we see that we have x squared, and we have 1h squared plus 1h squared, which is 2h squared, excuse me, uh, 1hx plus 1hx, which is 2hx, and then finally plus h squared. So when we do the squaring of x plus h, we replace that then with x squared plus 2hx plus h squared, and then minus 3 that's out here on the end. And then our next step would be to look at that expression and see if we can combine any terms, see if we can add some terms together. But we cannot. And so we pause there and now consider the next step that we need to do. Let me come down here for that next step so I won't be uh, having interference on the right. The, the next step, since we know the component of f of x plus h, what we would actually like to do next is decide what the numerator of that fraction really looks like. And of course, it's f of x plus h minus f of x, and so we need to perform that operation. Now, above this line, we actually have f of x plus h. That's the x squared plus the 2hx plus the h squared minus the 3. So this amount is the f of x plus h, of course. And then we're going to subtract from that f of x. Now, f of x is way up here, isn't it? That tells us what f of x is. f of x is simply x squared minus 3. And of course, notice I put that in parentheses because that's what we're subtracting. If I fail to put the parentheses, we may get the signs wrong because we may fail to distribute that negative. But of course, this is the f of x that we're subtracting. So using simple algebraic techniques, we notice that the first set of parentheses is really a matter of convenience to just show what two things we were subtracting. Those first parentheses we can easily remove because there's no multiplications on it, there's no subtractions. But the second parentheses, we're subtracting x squared minus 3, and that means we're subtracting x squared and subtracting negative 3. Well, that becomes a minus x squared, of course, and a plus 3. Now when we set, step back and look at this result, we'll notice this time there are some terms we can combine. We see that we have an x squared in this position, and we have a minus x squared in this position. So the x squareds are going to add to 0. And similarly, we have a minus 3 and a plus 3. Those will add to 0. So we'll be left only with 2hx plus h squared, which is simply the numerator of this expression we're taking the limit of. And by the way, that expression is called the difference quotient. The third step 
is to use the information we've just uh, uh, found and actually create the fraction that we're taking the limit of. So that's f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. And above here, we see what f of x plus h minus f of x is. It's just simply that expression. So our numerator is 2hx plus h squared, and our denominator is h. Now, we always like to um, reduce a fraction, simplify a fraction if it's possible. Now, a common mistake is to try to cancel the h in the denominator with the h in the 2hx. But remember, we can't cancel unless we have things in a factored form. And the numerator itself is not factored. Uh, so before we could do any canceling, and by the way, the only thing we could cancel is an H because that's the only thing in the denominator. So we hope we have an H factor in the numerator. And when we look at the two terms, the first term has an H, 2HX, and the second term has an H, which tells us we do have a common factor. So if we factor out an h from the numerator, we're factoring out an h from 2hx, so that would leave a 2x, and we're factoring out an h from h squared, and so that would just leave an h. And of course, the denominator is h. And now we see that it's the h that we have here, and the h in the denominator that can actually be canceled. So we're left with just 2x plus h as the simplified version of that fraction. Well, now we're really about set to do things because remember what we're, this is the fourth step, and remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to determine the derivative. And remember the derivative, that is f prime of x, is the limit as h approaches zero of this difference quotient, f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. And we've just shown on the previous step that that difference quotient really is just the simplified expression 2x plus h. So that's actually what we're taking the limit of. Now, let's look at this. The easiest way to find limits is by substitution if it causes us no grief. But the, the, what is changing is the h value. So what we're going to do is substitute a 0 for the h value. And when we do that substitution, we don't have the lim any longer. That's actually creating or determining the limit. So we end up with a 2x plus 0 for h. And of course, that is just 2x. So here's that's kind of the, the conclusion of what we've got here. A couple of things. Remember, our original function was f of x equal x squared minus 3. And what we've just found is that our derivative of this function, f prime of x, is simply 2x. I want you to also note that when we find a derivative, the result is a new function. And there's certainly a relationship between the derivative function and the original function. That's something that we'll learn a little bit later. But we need to practice more of finding these derivatives. So on the next page, we'll have an additional problem that's a little more involved. OK, as you can see here, our second problem uh, says find f prime of x, or find the derivative of x, if f of x is equal to 2 over x. Now, remember the way we find f prime of x. And I know that this is on the previous page, in fact, the previous two pages. But you'll notice that I write it again, and the main reason for me writing it again is so that you get into the practice of writing it every time you're getting ready to use it, and that way you will have it memorized without much effort. So uh, please get into this practice. Write it rather than just look at it. So there's the way we calculate a limit. Uh, excuse me, a derivative. It's by a limit. But remember, we have a four-step process. 
And the, the first step of the four steps is to, is to determine what f of x plus h is. Now, in this case, f of x, you know, f of x, that's way back up here, f of x being 2 over x means whatever we have in the function, our input into the function ends up being the denominator of the fraction. So our input in this case down here is x plus h. And so we'll create a fraction that has 2 in the numerator and our input x plus h in the denominator. So this was a much easier process than we saw a moment ago. But we'll find out that this pro whole problem ends up being a little more difficult. So the second step of our process is to actually calculate the value of the numerator we're going to find the limit of. And that's f of x plus h minus f of x. So as we did before, we first write down f of x plus h, which we see as the fraction 2 over x plus h. And as we subtract from that f of x, which we know is the fraction just 2 over x. So here's where this becomes more difficult, is that we actually have to subtract two fractions here. A while ago, we were, in, in the previous problem, we were working only on polynomials. So when we're looking to find, uh, actually do the subtraction, we've got to have a common denominator. And we use the lowest common denominator. And when the two denominators don't have any factors in common, then the lowest common denominator is simply the product of those two denominators. So our lowest common denominator is x times x plus h. So let's recall how we deal with things like that. We need to change this first fraction so that it has x times x plus h as, denom as its denominator, which means we need to take the fraction that we already have, and we need to multiply it with an x in the numerator and x in the denominator. See, all we're really doing is multiplying it with 1, x over x being 1. So we're not changing the fraction. We're just going to change the way it looks. And then we've got to take the fraction that's 2 over x. And in this case, we need an x plus h factor in the bottom. So we have to multiply with an x plus h in the bottom. But we've got to make sure we're multiplying by 1, so we multiply with an x plus h in the top. So we're doing a multiplication, so let's make sure that we understand we're multiplying that whole uh, numerator and denominator. Now the result of this multiplication will give us a couple of new fractions. Let's see. The first fraction, x times 2, we'll write as 2x, and x times x plus h, we'll just write in that fashion. And in the second uh, fraction, we'll have 2 times x plus h, so we'll say 2 times x plus h, and of course in the denominator we have x times x plus h. Now maybe I burned an extra step there, because what I would really like you to recognize is in that second fraction, the 2 times x plus h can actually be completed, can it? So we'll have a 2x over x times x plus h minus 2 times x is 2x, plus 2 times h is 2h, over x times x plus h. So this gives us the process that we're going to have a new fraction that has the denominator x times x plus h. In the numerator, we have 2x subtract. And we don't just write down 2x plus h because we're actually subtracting that whole numerator. So parentheses are required there. But we know that when we distribute that negative sign, we'll have a 2x in the front and minus 2x and minus 2h. That negative sign distributes through both of those over x times x plus h. And then we see that that numerator will simplify. That is, we have a 2x here and a minus 2x here, so it leaves us with just minus 2h divided by x times x plus h. So we need to go to the next page to uh, complete this. See, we've run out of room. Now, the, remember the third step, okay, 
The third step in our process is to actually form the fraction that we're going to take the limit of. And so if you recall, that fraction is f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h. And on the previous page, we found that f of x plus h minus f of x is a fraction itself. It's the fraction negative 2h divided by x times x plus h. And of course, the denominator of this fraction here is just h. Now, we need to simplify this fraction, and it's actually a complex fraction. So remember, when fractions are involved, it's nice to think of the uh, divisor as a fraction itself. So we can think of this as h over 1. And when we have a fraction divided by a fraction, we take the top fraction and multiply it by the reciprocal of the bottom fraction. We used to say reciprocate and multiply. So our top fraction, negative 2h over x times x plus h, is going to be multiplied with the reciprocal of the bottom fraction. And when we reciprocate the bottom fraction, we end up with 1 over h. And now we investigate what result we have there. And we see that we're going to have a factor of h in the numerator and a factor of h in the denominator. That is, the factor h here and the factor h here will cancel, won't they? So that will leave simply a negative 2 in the numerator and only an x times x plus h in the denominator. Okay. Well, we're, we're ready now to actually calculate the derivative because the derivative, that is f prime of x, is the limit as h approaches 0 of this difference quotient or this fraction f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h. And we just illustrated that that fraction simplifies to nothing more than negative 2 divided by x times x plus h. Okay, so that's the fraction we're actually taking the, the limit of. Now remember, h is the variable in this case. h is what's moving. And it's getting closer and closer to 0, and so our substitution will be put a 0 in for h. So we end up with negative 2 divided by x, we don't substitute it, times x plus a 0 for the h value. And we see, of course, x plus 0 is just x, so this uh, comes down to the fact that we have a negative 2 in the numerator and x times x, or x squared in the denominator. So again, let's note what we have. We started with f of x. And f of x was 2 over x. And then we found, from using this limit information, we found that the derivative of f, that is f prime of x, is the fraction negative 2 divided by x squared. And once again, of course, this is our result. That's really what we came up with. Once again, we see the derivative is itself a function. And that's, again, what's going to happen over and over. Well, we've seen a couple of examples of calculating the derivative function. Now we need to see the significance of that calculation. So as you see, I've uh, titled this, What is the Significance of the Derivative? And you see I have a graph, and I, I want to start labeling some positions on this graph. But this is the graph, or a partial graph, that is, of the function f. Okay, and uh, I'm going to just find some arbitrary value on the graph. Let's say, uh, uh, suppose, right, eh, that's actually a little more curved than I had planned. Well, let's suppose this is where some arbitrary value x is. 
And so that corresponds maybe with a point that looks like this on the graph. Now, it's important for us to recognize how we could label that point. I mean, that point has an x value and a y value. And we calculate the y value by putting x into f. That is, the, the coordinates of the point that we see right down here, the first coordinate is x, and the second coordinate is calculated as f of x. So they're the coordinates of that point. Now what I want to do next is I want to move to another point that is on the graph. And I'm going to do that by taking a distance from x of h amount. See, I'm going to take an h amount, that's just some value, and so this distance is h, and so I'm going to get a new position for x. Now, if I started at x, and I go h units away from x, then this new value of x is actually the old x plus h more. So this position, okay, corresponds to this point on the graph. Now, this point on the graph, of course, has coordinates. And the first coordinate is the x value we're at, and we're at the x value x plus h. And the second, whoops, I blew that. Let me, let me scratch that, I'm sorry. The first coordinate is x plus h. Okay, that's the x value. Now the y value we calculate by putting the x into the function. So the y value is actually f of x plus h. Right. That may look a little bit familiar. So we have two lines on this graph. Now if we connect these two lines, that is if we, uh, these two points, excuse me, two points on the graph. If we connect these two points, that is if we draw the line that goes through these two points, then we'll get a line like that. And a line of that type, a line that uh, goes through two points on the graph of a curve is called a secant line. Okay? So this is an example of a secant line. Now, let's pause here and think about how we calculate the slope of a line. The way we calculate the slope of a line is with the slope formula, okay, and the slope formula says m for slope is y sub 2 minus y sub 1 divided by x sub 2 minus x sub 1. Now in this specific case, we want to know about the slope of the secant line, okay, slope of a uh, secant line slope, slope of the secant line. Okay, well the way we calculate a slope, let's see what we would have here. Let's see if we've got room. The slope of the secant line. Well the secant line we're looking at, notice that the, the, uh, the second y value so we're talking about y sub 2. The second y value is the y value that we see right here, f of x plus h. So this ends up being f of x plus h for our y sub 2 minus, now our y sub 1 is the y from this point, which is f of x. And then in the denominator, we have x sub 2 minus x sub 1. We'll remember x sub 2 is the x value of this point. So we, that's our x sub 2, which is x plus h, minus, and our x sub 1 is the x from this point, which is just x. Now, let's, let's take that. Let's kind of, let me move that over here because I really got myself into a corner. Here we're talking about the secant line slope. And if we look at that fraction, particularly in the denominator of that fraction, okay, in the denominator of that fraction, and this, this is already looking a little bit familiar, isn't it? In the denominator of that fraction, we have an x plus h and a minus x. 
And that will leave x minus x, which is going to be 0, which just leaves behind an h all alone. So this ends up being m is equal, that is the slope is equal to f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. And that looks very familiar, doesn't it? Now, we need to understand what's happening here, that when we calculate the derivative, and we still need to go to the graph above, but remember that f prime of x is the limit as h approaches 0 of the fraction f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h, which is the fraction we see that represents the slope of the secant line. So what we're really doing here is we're finding the limit as h approaches 0 of the slope of the secant line. See, that's exactly what this is from above. I didn't label it secant line up here, but it's just a slope. Okay, now let's kind of see. So we're finding the limit of the slope of secant lines as h gets closer and closer to 0. So let's imagine what that means. If we look on the graph above, we see a big H, but we're letting H in this limit get closer and closer to zero. So for instance, we might have an H that is smaller now. So in this instance, the H is this distance, okay? That's the H value, it's getting smaller. Well, if, if that's the H value, then the point we're at in this case is this point. And when we consider the secant line that the original point, that is, here's the original point, and this new point here, drawing the graph, drawing the line that goes through those two points, gives us a new secant line, and so we have a new slope. Now here's really the significance. As these H's get smaller and smaller, Imagine the points are moving along this graph, and we're drawing new secant lines for each one of them. And eventually, we'll be so close that what we'll have is a secant line that looks like this. And I'm going to kind of, I'm going to dash this one. I probably should have dashed the others. But what's going on is that our secant lines are getting closer and closer to the line I've drawn here because our points are moving in closer and closer to that position because our h is getting closer and closer to zero. In other words, our points are moving along here and they're getting close to this original point where x is. And so that is essentially the line that I've drawn is the tangent line to the graph. See, the line I've drawn here is the tangent line to the graph at specifically x. So what's happening is as we change where our secant lines are, and remember the derivative is the limit of the slopes of the secant lines. As we change where our secant lines are because h is getting small, then we're actually getting closer and closer to the tangent line and so our slopes of secant lines are getting closer and closer to what the slope is of the tangent line. So the ultimate result is this limit is nothing more than the slope of the tangent line. At x. The derivative is a slope of a tangent line. Okay, now we, we need to come back and do a little bit more here, and I know it's difficult. You know, I'm pointing with my pen, but you can't see that. And so it's a little more difficult by just seeing the results of the writing and not showing me pointing at things. But uh, this is the main thing that we need to recognize is derivatives and slopes of tangent lines are equivalent. That's really the big issue here. Let me pause uh, and get ready for the next, uh, the, the next page. So 
on this stage, we're going to look at an additional problem. And this is really the crux of what we're trying to accomplish. You know, in problem one or two, we found the way, or we looked at examples of actually calculating a derivative. But now, not only are we going to calculate the derivative in problem three, we're going to use what the derivative is all about. So as you see, I'll read to you, given the function f of x equal x squared minus 6x plus 11, find the slope of the tangent line to the curve at the point 2 comma 3. Now, and occasionally, we might just say find the slope of the tangent line to the curve at x equal 2. That might be the way it's asked. Okay, but of course, if we know the x value is 2, then we can use the function to calculate the y value. That is, we can substitute the 2 into the function. Now, here's, here's again the very important, or the, the, the middle of the argument, that the slope of a tangent line is determined by the derivative. And the, so the slope of the tangent line is equal to the derivative. Now this is the slope of the tangent line at x. So if we want to know the slope of the tangent line at the x value that is 2, then what we're really going to need to do is we know that slope we're looking for is f prime of 2. Okay, f prime of 2. Now, when we calculated f prime of x, it was a function. It was a formula. And so we can actually think of that function as a tangent line slope generator. That that's the formula or the function that will calculate the slope of a tangent line anywhere on the curve. We just need to know the x value that we're interested in. So our first job here is to actually find the derivative function. So we need to first, before we go too far, is to first find what f prime of x is. And then we know what f prime of x is, we can substitute 2 into the function to find the slope of interest to us. So, remember the way we find f prime of x. It's a limit, isn't it? f prime of x is the limit as h approaches 0 of this complicated f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. And this is going to be the hard part of the problem. After we get this done, it's pretty easy. So remember the steps that we take. First, we find f of x plus h. So that re means we replace every x with an x plus h. So it becomes x plus h squared minus 6 times x plus h. And then finally, plus 11. Now we saw in a previous problem how to expand x plus h squared. I'm just going to write it in the result that we would get. When we expand x plus h squared, we would get x squared plus 2hx plus h squared. And then we see we're multiplying negative 6 with x plus h, and that would give us a negative 6x and a minus 6h and plus 11. We can't simplify that further. So our next move is to determine what f of x plus h minus f of x is. And so that means we would take the expression above, which is long and complicated. So I'm just rewriting that entire expression from above. And from that, we would subtract f of x which is simply x squared minus 6x plus 11. And just to be precise, then let's write down the steps. Here is a place that is very tempting, because there's a lot of writing. It's very tempting to start shortcutting and not go through the writing process. And if you do that, then you're likely to make an error, and it's not worth that. So this subtraction is going to cause a minus x squared and a plus 6x and a minus 11. And then when we review, we'll see that we have an x squared minus x squared. And we'll see we have a minus 6x and a plus 6x. 
and we'll see that we have a plus 11 and a minus 11. And so if we look above, what's left is 2hx plus h squared minus 6h. That's the result. Recall then the next step in the process is to actually complete the fraction. f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h, which ends up being 2hx plus h squared minus 6h. And that's all divided by h. But we want to simplify the fraction, so we have to factor the numerator. And we see that we have a common factor of h as we did before. We'll factor out an h. That'll leave a 2x plus an h to the first power minus just 6, all divided by h. And then we see that we can cancel h's. And so that leaves us with just 2x plus h minus 6. So the derivative function, f prime of x, remember, is the limit of the fraction we have above. It's the limit as h approaches 0 of this fraction, f of x plus h. I know I'm doing a lot of repetitive writing, but I want it to be clear of what we're actually doing. And when we go through and calculate this limit, See, I'm afraid I'm running out of room, so I'm going to go horizontally rather than vertically. I don't really like doing this. But we found out that that uh, fraction actually is the simple expression that is just 2x plus h minus 6. And to find that limit as h approaches 0, we just need to substitute in an, a 0 for h. So that ends up being 2x plus 0 minus 6, which simplifies to just 2x minus 6. So bottom line right now is that f prime of x is 2x minus 6. Like I said, think of this as a tangent line, tangent lines uh, slope, remember, we're talking about slopes of tangent lines. A tangent line slope generator or calculator. If we know the x value that we're interested in for the tangent line, then we just put that x value into this derivative. So uh, I've run out of room here. I need to go to the next page. Let me pause for a moment. Okay, it, uh, let me, uh, just to get written on this page, remember from the previous page, we had found that f prime of x is equal to 2x minus 6. Now, our original question was, what is the slope of the tangent line? to the curve, or to the graph, of what was it? f of x equal to x squared minus 6x plus 11 at the point 2 comma 3. That was our original question. And uh, we know that we calculate uh, slopes with the derivative, slopes of tangent lines. So the way we would answer this question is the slope we need is going to be calculated with f prime, and we put the x value of the point that we're the for the point of tangency. That is, the x value that we're interested in here is the x value two. So we put. 2 into the derivative. And of course we use the function to calculate that so that when we put 2 into the derivative it becomes 2 times 2 minus 6 from above and of course that ends up being 4 minus 6 or negative 2. So the slope of the tangent line in question is negative 2. Now 
Let me pause again, and I'm going to prepare a graph for us to look at so we'll see the significance one more time. Uh, and, and in fact, we can actually co uh, calculate slopes of other tangent lines. So uh, I'll pause, and then we'll start again. Okay, you can see that I've drawn a graph of f of x equal x squared minus 6x plus 11. I've been as careful as possible. Uh, it's not perfect, but it, we can work with it. And uh, for the most part, I just plotted points. That is, I chose an x of 0 and calculated y to be 11. I chose x to be 1 and calculated y to be 6. Uh, we already knew that 2 comma 3 was on the graph, but I chose 2 and calculated y to be 3. But really, the very first thing I did was find the vertex, because I know this is a quadratic function, which is a parabola, and I know that it opens up because it's a positive x squared. It starts with a positive. And I really wanted to know the vertex. So let me remind you how I calculated the vertex, because that's the important point that's right down here, isn't it? Right down there at the bottom. So the vertex formula, if you recall, is, uh, tells us how to calculate the x value of the vertex. And of course, the x value of the vertex, the formula, is its negative b over 2a. Remember that from a long time ago, or at least from college algebra. Now, the b represents the coefficient of x, and the a represents the coefficient of a, 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 x squared in the function. So we have the negative of our b value, which is negative 6. That's the coefficient of the x up here, isn't it? Divided by 2 times a, and a is 1, that's the coefficient of x squared in our function up above. And so when we calculate that, we end up getting a value of 3. Now, that's the x value of the vertex. To calculate the y value of the vertex, we just put that 3 value into the function. So that means we would put it in for x, so we'd have an x squared minus 6 times a 3, that is a 3 squared minus a 6 times a 3 plus 11. And when I did this calculation, I got a result of 2. And so that told me that the vertex occurs at the point 3 comma 2. And of course, here is the point 3 comma 2. Okay. Now, uh, remember what we just did a moment ago. We were interested in 2 comma 3, the tangent line at 2 comma 3. And so there is the point 2 comma 3, right there. And we call that the point of tangency. Now, I suppose we could draw that tangent line. Let's see if I can draw that tangent line, uh, at least a representation of the tangent line. So let's see. Here's, here's the tangent line in question. Tangent to the point 2 comma 3. Now, what we did with this derivative is we found the slope of that tangent line. And we did that by using the derivative and putting the x value of 2. And the x value of 2 belongs to the point of tangency. And when we did that, remember the way we did it, f prime of x was 2x minus 6. And so when we put 2 into that, excuse me, yeah, when we put 2 into that, we calculated it and got negative 2. So we're saying the slope of the line that I've drawn there, that tangent line, is negative 2. And that certainly makes sense, doesn't it? It's a, a line that is going downward. Now, there's actually a lot more that we can do now. Now that we have the derivative, see, now that we know this derivative, it actually counts, calculates slopes of any tangent line. So what if we wanted to know the slope at x equal 3, and I'm referring to the slope of the tangent line. Well, at x equal 3, oh, that's actually this position, isn't it? And so imagine the, the tangent line that we would have here. Well, let, let's actually calculate the slope. The way we would do it is in this case, the tangent line we're talking about there, we would say m is equal to, slope is equal to f prime of 3, the x value. So we would put 3 into the derivative function, and that would calculate to be 6 minus 6, wouldn't it? 
See, that would be 6 minus 6, which is 0. So the slope of the tangent line when x is 3 is 0. Now, if we have a slope that's 0, it means that the line is horizontal. And that makes a bit of sense because we're talking about this point of tangency. And if we imagine the tangent line at that point, let me draw that line. If we imagine the tangent line at that point, yes, that's a horizontal tangent line. And the slope of that tangent line it would, in fact, be zero. Let's consider this. What if we wanted to know the slope uh, of the tangent line when x is 5? Okay, so we might ask that question. What's the slope of the tangent line at x equals 5? Well, this is easy because we simply have a slope generator called the derivative. So we would just use the derivative and put 5 into the derivative so it would become 2 times 5 minus 6. Well, 2 times 5 minus 6 ends up being 10 minus 6 or 4. So the slope of the tangent line when x is 5 is 4. Well, that's a pretty steep line. Well, now look, when x is 5, we're talking about the point right here. That's the point of tangency when x is 5. And if we imagine the slope of that tangent line, that would be something like this, wouldn't it? And, of course, that is a positive slope, so it makes sense that it's positive 4, and it's very steep. A slope of 4 is steep. So once we know the derivative, we can ask for a lot of slopes, not just one single slope. And you see how it fits in with the graph. Uh, the, the next question, which we'll finish on the next page, is that not only do we want to know the slope of the tangent line at x equal 2, we'd like to know the equation of the tangent line. So let me pause and get ready for the next page. Okay, you can see here for problem 4, uh, and we're going to act like it's kind of a brand new problem. So the problem is find the equation of the tangent line to the graph of f of x equal x squared minus 6x plus 11 at the point 2 comma 3. And, and of course, we've already done a lot of work, but let's suppose that that was the question from scratch from the very beginning. And so we would, here's what we would need to know. That step one, if we want to find the equation of a line, any kind of line, then the very first thing we need to know is the slope of that line. So step one would be for us to do this. Is we, we are preparing to find the slope of the line, and that requires us to know the derivative. So we would have to find f prime of x. And that's the hard part of the problem. That's the hard part of the problem. Because uh, when we're doing that, we've got to find that limit, which takes us several steps. Now, we're fortunate here. You know, in this case, we've already done this. But it's a long process. So step one takes a while. But we actually calculated it to be uh, f prime of x to be 2x plus uh, minus 6. Like I said, this would be long normally, but we've already got that accomplished. Now, after we go through that long step that takes a while to do, step two is to use that information to uh, calculate or find uh, the slope. So find the slope of the tangent line, okay, of the particular tangent line in question. We do that, of course, by using f prime of x. That's the reason we calculated that above. Now, for our particular tangent line, um, it's a, it happens when x is 2. And so we calculate the derivative at the value of 2. And we saw before, I'll rewrite it, we saw before that when we evaluate this at 2, we get a negative 2 result. So now we have the slope of our tangent line, which we've done before, but we're acting like we hadn't. So we have the slope of a line. Now let's, let's, let's forget for a moment that it is a tangent line. To be able to calculate the equation of a line, we need a slope and we need a point. So let's make that for the equation of any line. 
for the equation of a line we need a slope we need the slope and a point on the line okay those are the things we need well we've already calculated the slope now here's the next thing to observe is that we need a point that is on the tangent line but here what we were given is a point that is on the graph see that's on the curve the graph but that's the point that the tangent line goes to that's our point of tangency so this point two comma three is on the graph of f but it's also on the line or the tangent line itself since that's the point of tangency so we have that information as well we have the slope is negative two and the point that we know that's on the tangent line is two comma three okay so here we go for for the next step step three is actually to use this information and calculate the equation of the line the tangent line And a normal way to do this is to use the formula y minus y sub 1 is equal to m slope times x minus x sub 1, where the, the point that we're using is actually x sub 1 comma y sub 1. That is our particular point, that's, that's what the x sub 1 and y sub 1 represent, our particular point is 2 comma 3. And of course, the slope or the m value in that equation we know is negative 2. So we put those values in. So y subtract the y value of our point, which is 3, equal m, which is the slope of our tangent line, times x minus the x value of the point. We just put those values in, and then we simplify. So we see this becomes y minus 3. When we multiply the negative 2 out, we get negative 2x plus 4. And then, of course, we're going to solve for y by adding 3 to both sides. When we add 3 to the left side, we have y alone. When we add 3 to the right side, it will just be a negative 2x plus 4 plus 3. And, of course, then that simplifies to negative 2x plus 7. So this equation is the equation of the tangent line that we were looking for. That is the equation of the tangent line that goes through the point 2 comma 3 on our graph. I'd like to close out this section about uh, finding the derivative. Uh, with just a, a note about the fact that the derivative doesn't always exist for all values of x. Let me, let me make a point of this. Okay. Not all functions are differentiable. all values of x. Which means, what I mean by that, is we can have functions that when we find the derivative, we can't have the slope of a tangent line, or the slope of the tangent line is undefined. So let me make a point of what those things look like. Uh, the, the two most common, and I'm going to use an example of uh, f of x equal x minus 3 to the power 2 thirds. Now, I don't care that you really understand what, uh, how to look at that graph, but what I'm going to do is give you an idea of what that graph looks like. Just a rough idea. Suppose uh, this is where x is equal to 3. Then the graph that I, the function that I've illustrated there would have a graph that would look like this. 
Now, the bottom line is in this case to point out that in this case, f prime of x does not exist at x equal 3. And so we might say the function is not differentiable at x equal 3. And the issue is that we have a point on the graph when x is equal to 3. Any time we have a point on a graph, then the function is not differentiable or doesn't have the slope of a tangent line at that particular position. And you can imagine what would happen. And if we start imagining tangent, I mean, uh, uh, secant lines or tangent lines, that the only possible type of tangent line we could have here would be one like that. And in that case, being a tangent line of that type, that slope would be undefined because it's a vertical line. So whenever there is a point on a graph, then the function is not differentiable or the derivative does not exist at that point. Uh, another example would be something that looks like this. f of x is equal to the cube root, we'll say, of x minus 3. Now, if we were to draw that graph, we would see something that looks like this. Uh, out here again is where x is equal to 3. And this graph would have a shape similar to what I'm going to show here. It would come along here, oops, come along here, and get to what it looks like would be vertical. Oh, my pen is not working at this point. What would be almost a vertical. And it, it never gets absolutely vertical, but it would look that way. Now, if you imagine this point on the graph when x is equal to 3, and imagine what the tangent line would have to look like, once again, it would be a tangent line that is vertical. And because that tangent line is vertical, then the derivative does not exist there. So once more, we would say in this case, f prime of x does not exist at x equal 3. Or another way to say it, this function is not differentiable at 3. Now, there's a couple of other types of examples, uh, just to, to, to illustrate again. If we see a graph that looks like this, and it's the graph of it, that kind of looks familiar, doesn't it? If we see a graph that looks like this, well, because it ends in a single point like we have here, then this function is not differentiable at x equals 0. f prime of x does not exist. at x equals 0 here. And again, it's because there's a single point there. How would we draw the tangent line? I mean, if we thought about secant lines, then, then again, the kind of what would happen is we'd have a tangent line that's vertical. But because it's a single point there, we really don't know how to draw a tangent line. So we can think that same way. And the, and the last example, I would say, might be something, uh, uh, would be maybe the graph of, let me write it down here, the graph of f of x equal 1 over x minus 3. Now, of course, that's a rational function, and uh, maybe we recall what that graph would look like, but out here at 3, we would actually, the graph's function is undefined at 3, isn't it? Uh, so that would be a vertical asymptote. And we would have a part of the graph here, and a part of the graph here. It would be in two different branches. And because the function is not defined at 3, and it's simply that reason, because the function is not defined, then how would the derivative be defined? We wouldn't have a tangent line on a place where the graph isn't defined. So once again, in this case, f prime of x does not exist at x equal 3, specifically here. Well, that concludes... Uh, the discussion for this section, uh, which is about finding the derivative or the definition of the derivative. Uh, we'll uh, start up with the next chapter and uh, some shortcuts to finding the derivative uh, in the next lecture.